Jerry Judy, to me, is the best route runner of any receiver in all of the country. No what, debate there. What a wide receiver room they have. Jerome Ford on the ground, initiating the contact. Able to crash into Michael Carter right there. I, 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 I think, Todd, that they have to play a little man-to-man. -man. You cannot just play zone. Matt Guerrero needs to mix it up. Done a great job early in this game, confusing Tonga Valoa. Again, it's Ford, try on the right side. Hit at the line, the football came out. Duke says they have it, let's see. Trey Hornbuckle has come up with the football. One of the Duke captains. And the early turnover goes the way of the Blue Devils. Dylan Singleton punched it free. Nick Saban decides to discipline Najee Harris and Brian Robinson. And so Jerome Ford gets the start and he gets that ball poked out. It looked like Sarah Nord came through and got a big paw on that football. Great play by Sarah Nord. And Nick Saban's thinking, that's the cost, right? That's the cost of disciplining my starting two tailbacks. And if you're Duke, you're not going to get many shots. This has got to be the opportunity that you take advantage of early in the game. Send a message. It can't be three. This has got to be seven. On the ground. That's Mateo Durant. Gets the ball carry, his first of the game. You bring up a second down. You know, Jerome Ford is a redshirt freshman, and he didn't expect to be thrown into this situation. Obviously, he, he loves and would love to have this situation to carry the football. We don't know how long Najee Harris is going to be out. I would be surprised if he's out any much longer. Second down and five. On the triple option, please. <laughs> We, we didn't quite know what Daniel Jones, without Daniel Jones, what this offense was going to look like. David Cutcliffe has a history, right? When Peyton Manning left Tennessee, they went on and won the national championship right. with T. Martin, right? You had to change the offense. So what does Quentin Harris do best? Right now he thinks it's calming himself down, running the football, being effective, giving Alabama something they never thought they would be preparing for, running the triple option. Third and five. Big play, as McShea says, can't settle for three here. Gave it to the first man through. It's Durant, and he's got the first down. Looks like Alabama's guessing a little bit early. Well, there's no way that Alabama could have been ready to, to play the triple option, right? Like, this is old school, B back, C back, and A back, three backs in the backfield, and Quinn Harris under center operating the option. It's This looks like Georgia Tech with the two wing backs. Harris will keep it himself for a couple runs into the front of that Alabama defensive line and you know the veterans if they were in there for Alabama if they had their guys like Dylan Moses even they might be surprised then you compound that with the youngsters right when you have those two freshman linebackers Shane Lee and Christian Harris you see Pete Golding tried to I guarantee you they weren't practicing against the option in practice I was watching practice they weren't doing it okay but but this goes to David Cutcliffe you know how, how good he is as a coach that he's able to put something like this in I don't think they'll do it the whole game but it's a good changeup. Second down and eight from the 14. Harris going to loft one. End zone. It is incomplete. Nearly brought down by Jalen Calhoun in double coverage. Gerard Maiden was there. That's a really good throw. Calhoun was in position. He had two hands on the ball. I'm standing right here five yards away from him. He almost made that play. It would have been huge, obviously, for this Duke offense. But listen, when we talked to David Cutcliffe, he said, and he's, he's aware, he knows just like everybody who's watching this game now, they're overmatched physically. He said, we've got to out-scheme them, we've got to out-formation them, and so far, that's what they're doing offensively. Five touchdown underdog, give or take, coming into this one. On the ground, Deion Jackson right up the middle. He's going to be short. Shaheen Carter made the stop before the imaginable yellow marker. Great blocking up front. Gray, the tight end, with a great crack back block. Brings up a fourth down, and I 1,000% agree with this decision to go for it here on fourth and short. Let's go. Welcome back, college football. And he didn't get there. The Bama defense stands tall. 
Great job right up the middle. We're going to see here's Shane Lee right here. He's not going to get blocked. It's a nice job by the defensive line taking two blockers, and there's nobody left to get to the second level for Lee. Ultimately, Alabama turns the football over, gives great field position to Duke. They get a completely different look than they were expecting with the option looks, but this is Alabama, right? They adjust physically up front, they take over, and they keep Duke from getting any points. And Bama's true freshmen are still all four and five star guys, and they'll pick it up pretty quickly. So nothing to show on the turnover. Tungabaloa comes out throwing. We welcome Jerry Judy to the game for first down yardage. Forced out of bounds by Josh Blackwell. They've kept Jerome Ford in at running back, but uh, enough is enough. It's time to get number four going in this football game. Exactly 10 on the play. Matt Womack is moved up to right guard in place of Landon Dickerson. Dickerson can also play some center. Well, watch for that. First down and 10 now from the Bama. 17. Ford still in there. Play fake. Some pressure. Togabaloa going to load up and take a shot for Judy. Nothing doing. Josh Blackwell had the coverage. The problem with Jerome Ford, having Jerome Ford in there is there's no sting to the play action. You see the defense, that's Blackwell. He's not, he's not going for the play fake, knowing that they want to get the ball to Jerry Judy. So he's running out of there with one purpose in mind. Don't let Jerry Judy get behind me. And, and Brian, Tua's best trait is his deep ball accuracy. He was just falling off balance on that last throw. Second down and 10 upcoming. We should point out no Mark Gilbert for Duke, their best cornerback. Likely done for the season following left hip surgery. A delay game here. Yep, zeroes on the play clock. Delay of game. Offense. Five yard penalty. Still second down. One of the things I've noticed early for Tua in this football game is he's using a dummy snap count. He wants to identify what Duke is doing on the defensive side. Then he's looking to the sideline to Sark to help him make these checks. You can do that. That's fine if you're in the no huddle, but you have to keep awareness of the play clock. Second and 15 now after the penalty from the 12. Quick drop and throw and complete Jalen Waddle making people miss. Jalen Waddle with yards after the catch. And he's out to the 40. Kobe Kwanzaa eventually got there. But not until it was a big gain. Ripped off 30 yards on the play. They're going to get a hold here, Levy. There's a flag down right in the backfield. I think they're going to get the center, Chris Owens, for a takedown. All the way back at the nine is where the flag Holy is. Offense, number 79. Half the distance to the goal. Repeat second down. Yeah, this, this wasn't really necessary here, right? It's, it's, he's he's going to get the blitzing linebacker as he, as he comes through. There's a defensive end, and he just throws him down. And any time an official, an umpire, sees an offensive lineman turn and throw somebody down, they're going to throw that flag. It looked like he tripped, but just unnecessary. Wipes out the 30-yard gain. That's, that's the, a, a question for this offense, the loss of Ross Piercebacher from a year ago, who was an outstanding center. Owens has to step up. So it's second and 21 now from the six. Quick throw right back to Waddle. And he's trying to get it all back. Kwanzaa got there from behind to take him down. It's a gain of 16. Gets half of the yardage. Last drive in a third down situation. Duke decided to bring some zone pressure. Trying to confuse Tonga Vailoa. They got to him. We'll see if they decide to dial up another pressure situation here. Right now it looks like man-to-man -man with one free safety. Ford remains in the backfield. The redshirt freshman who coughed up the football earlier. Third and five. Pressure coming. Out for Judy. And he's got the first down and wanting more down the sideline. Jerry Judy's second grab. Gain of 11. Smart play there from Tua. You identify man coverage. First thing I'm going to do if I'm a quarterback, find number four in red. And wherever he's going, I'm going to give him a chance. And that time he made Michael Carter look like he was on skates. 
Kwanzaa out. Brandon Hill checks in. We'll keep an eye on the thumb for Kwanzaa, who's been heavily involved to this point. See the numbers on Tunga Valoa, 4 of 5. Do I hear 5 of 6? I do. It's Judy again. He's going the wrong way. Now he turns it upfield. And slips down on that Bama sideline. <laughs> this is a Patton West Coast route right here. You're going to see two crosses in front and then Jerry Judy behind. They didn't run this route a year ago. This is the influence of Steve Sarkeesian getting his best player into the game after turning the football over on the last drive. Wholesale changes you see for that Duke defense. Judy's got three catches for 35. Got 14 on the last play. First down and 10, approaching midfield now. That's Ruggs in motion. Give it to him. Henry Ruggs, the fastest man on the field. Just across midfield. Molly. Understandably, see Jerome Ford was devastated after he fumbled that football, but Najee Harris had an arm around him, never left his side here on the sideline and said, you will be okay, get out of your head, we need you. So just some early jitters for that young running back, Steve. As you would expect, Molly, thank you. Second down and five. That's Forrestal to block right, looking left, and Judy wasn't looking. Miscommunication between the quarterback and the receiver. So Steve Sarkeesian is going to call some plays that have run. It's a run play, and he's going to tell Tua, and he's going to tell Jerry Judy, listen, if there's a good look of off coverage there, I'm going to throw you the hitch route, right? So Judy's got to run the hitch. It's got to be communicated from Tua. First game of the season, you're going to expect some of those miscommunications. Eighth play of the drive coming up. Still scoreless. With five to go in the first quarter, and that will surprise some. That's Forrest over tight end in motion. Pressure. Tunga Baloa gets away. And now he'll take off. He's got the first down and won't absorb a hit. Runs out of bounds. Shaka Hayward was running him down. Gain of nine. A lot of what's overlooked with Tua Tunga Baloa is his mobility. Shaka Hayward has him dead to rights. And he just doesn't break down. He thinks he's going to take a shot. And Tonga Vailoa doesn't panic. Steps up and releases outside for a first down. Kwanzaa's back in there. Play action. Tonga Vailoa takes a hit as he throws. And couldn't loft it up high enough for Ruggs. And if Ruggs can't run under it, nobody can. Well, Ruggs couldn't run under that one, but Jalen Waddle had run right by the defense, right down the middle of the field. Tonga Vailoa didn't see him. Normally, when you have those two receiver routes on one side of the field, you look at the inside first to Waddle and then go outside, and Tua just skipped him. Judy will take a breather. John Mechie, true freshman, has checked in. More pressure from Duke. Quick toss is completed. That is John Mechie, the freshman from Brampton, Ontario. He was born in Taiwan, moved to Ghana, and then to Canada from age six through high school. Gets a grab. He's on the board, five yards. Right off the bat, I think you see from this Duke defense, they don't want to give up the big play, right? That's what Alabama did so well last year, all year long. So they're staying soft on the outside. They're going to give you the out route, the hitch route, come up and make the tackle. They just don't want to give the big play. Judy's back in there. Pitch to Ford. Duke's there and ready to meet the challenge. Brandon Hill, the hard stick, and it's fourth down. Great job by Brandon Hill. Played a lot on this defense. They had so many injuries a year ago. So he's played a lot of football, even though he's in a backup role tonight. And I think Alabama's going to kick a field goal here. That goes to show you the respect that they have, at least early in this game, without Najee Harris to run the football of converting on fourth and short. Will Reichard is the kicker, the freshman, the true freshman from Hoover. His first college attempt. This will be from 49 yards away. And it's off the upright and no good. 
Bama does not struggle in too many aspects, but the place kicking game has been a bit of a problem. So they go to Reichard. And from 49, his welcome to college football. We'll be telling that story. Clank in 1967. That's an unbelievable story. So cool to read the history of Wallace Wade. And I know David Cutcliffe has so much respect for him and what he did. But it's a unique story, a tie between these two programs. Britton Brown, his first carry. They'll run Brown and Jackson in there at the same time. And Raquan Davis makes the stop for Alabama, number 99 in Crimson. My favorite part of that Wallace Wade story was in, in 1941, Duke was 5-0, and and they were scheduled to play in the Rose Bowl. But because of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, they couldn't play at the Rose Bowl. They relocated the Rose Bowl game to Duke, the stadium at Duke. Bet you didn't know that the Rose Bowl game was played at Duke one time. I'm not sure anybody else knew that either. Good job, right up the middle. Britton Brown puts a foot in the dirt for the artificial turf. You get the idea. Xavier McKinney brought him down, but not until he had 16. Duke has got to get Britton Brown and Deion Jackson going in the run game to take pressure off of Quentin Harris. A huge gaping hole in that Alabama defense. Hey, Duke's had really good starting field position in their third possession now. Trying to make something happen. First down and 10. It's Brown again, not that time. I don't think you can underestimate the fact that Quinn and Williams is not on this football team for Alabama, okay? We all know what kind of player he was. D.J. Dale is a true freshman. We talked about the linebackers, but they also have a true freshman replacing Quinn and Williams. He's number 94. He's a, a going to be a great player, a physical specimen, but he's just young. He was the talk of the spring for Alabama. 6'3", 308, true freshman from Pinson, Alabama. On the ground, right back to Brown. Pick up about five or six. Anthony Jennings, the stop, fifth-year senior for Alabama, making the tackle. You know, going up against that true freshman is a seasoned veteran for Duke at center in Jack Wallaball. He's their best offensive lineman. He was a tr grad trans. He was a transfer from Ohio State. You know that he, they are confident that there's no mismatch. Despite Duke versus Alabama, there's no mismatch at the center position for them. Comes some good stock. Dad Dave, an excellent offensive lineman in the NFL. As flags fly, we'll check the marker. Dave Wollenbach played nine years in the league. New England, Cleveland, St. Louis. False start. Offense, number 63 and others. Five-yard penalty, third down. So that's, that's Jacob Monk. Monk is a true freshman. Arrived in January. How would you like your first game to be here in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium against Alabama as a true freshman? That just goes to show you how much confidence they have in him because that is not the uh, not the start you want to have to your career. Speaking of that, the protection breaks down and Harris throwing it away. Xavier McKinney got to Quentin Harris. McKinney lined up right behind the defensive end. He's almost hiding over here on the left side of the, of the screen, and he just comes at the very last moment. You can see Britton Brown knew he was responsible for him. This is not on Quentin Harris. That's on number eight, Britton Brown, and he takes a big shot. So we mentioned Monk, the true freshman. Casey Holman, who's starting at left tackle. It's his first college start, too. Something to watch for. Austin Parker back. For his second punt, puts it in the air. Not going to scrape the roof. Waddle will run away from it, and it'll be into the end zone for a touchback. Josh itself is not recent. Alabama knew this was coming. This was an event that the players missed a team event way back in camp. Uh, only, only the story came out this week. Yeah, and I give Nick... Nick Saban credit. I mean, he knows what he's doing. He knows how he's going to get the attention of his football team. Listen, after what happened at the end of last year in the, in the national championship game, every single player on this team was listening to Nick Saban, right? He told us last night, he felt like at the end of last year, guys, they, they, they lost their humility. And then because they lost that humility, they lost their attention to detail and doing things the right way. So something happens in the offseason, and for your top guys, these are all starters. Uh, are going to be disciplined. And I, I give him credit for sticking to it. And I would say also, Alabama had one scoreless first quarter last season. That was 
here in the SEC Championship game against Georgia. You Steve know, Levy, Brian Greasy, Todd McShay, Molly McGrath as we get ready to open up quarter number two. First time for Najee Harris in the ball game. Looks like that suspension was for one quarter, and now he's in the game. Fake to Harris. Now they'll throw it to him. This looks like it's coming back. There's a flag down as Harris will continue to run. Najee Harris down the sideline. And we think it's coming back. Wow. Wow. What a momentum changer there. First play into the game. You just get him a little swing route. You see the athleticism and the speed. But Nick Saban, incredulous on the left tackle. Holding. Offense. Number 73. Ten-yard penalty. Repeat first down. That's a true freshman. Evan Neal. Wipes out a 53-yard welcome to the game from Najee Harris. Yeah, and it's clearly a, a hole. Chris Rump, the defensive tackle, is uh, getting around him. Chris Rump's only 225 pounds. Evan Neal is 360 pounds. So the quickness advantage goes to Rump, and Neal was just not ready for it. Hey, Grease, how do you know the suspension or discipline was over as opposed to sign of the way this thing's going and Bama needs some help running the football. It wasn't going well the whole first quarter, right? And Nick Saban doesn't want to be in a 0-0 game with Duke. <laughs> Jerome Ford fumbles the ball. If, the, if he wasn't suspended, they would have come in right after the fumble. First and 20 after the penalty. Tunga Bailoa hands it straight to Harris. He'll pick and choose his spots. And get out to the 29-yard line. Set for an update. Say a happy football season to Cassidy Hubbard. Kess, good to be with you all season long. Devontae Smith, he's also back from suspension and discipline and in the game and making an impact up against Dylan Singleton. I think the big story so far through a quarter and change has been inexperience. I mean, you, you talk about the defensive front, a nose tackle, two freshmen, two inside linebackers, two freshmen. You just saw the huge penalty there on the on the left guard, number 73, Evan Neal. And then the fumble from the young running back as well in Jerome Ford. So as talented as Alabama is, I think the big reason that Duke is still in this game at this point is because of the inexperience of the Crimson Tide. Third down and three. Tonga Baloa throwing and completing to Smith. Forward progress will have enough. It's a gain of four. Michael Carter brought him down. You saw Landon Dickerson had to leave. His helmet came off. I agree with Todd, but I also want to give some credit to this Duke defense. Remember a year ago, we did the game where they played against Clemson, and it was a 7-6 game almost up till halftime. Clemson scored a late touchdown to go up 14-6, but this defense did not back down from them, and they're not backing down today. Quick toss to Smith. And he will initiate contact and be thrown out of bounds by Marquise Waters but not until he had another first down. Or didn't get it. Let's see. Got a yard shy, maybe, the spot. Call it nine. Hard physical tackle by Waters. You saw a tackle from Michael Carter on the previous play. He's, Duke is not backing down. They, they have veteran off defensive line, veteran linebackers, and veterans all over this defense. Coach Cutcliffe said he was the most excited about this defense as he has been in his 12 years. Bit of a delay, and Harris stumbles forward. Didn't get there. Back to the line of scrimmage. Third and one upcoming at midfield. There's not a lot of movement right in the middle of that uh, offensive line for Alabama. You got Ed Edgar Serenord, that time Drew Jordan, who's a backup defensive lineman, mostly a pass rusher, but he's fighting in there in, in running situations and bring up another third and short. Hey, no Deontay Brown is the starter at left guard, but he has been suspended by the NCAA six games, so he's got four more on third and one. Harris gets just enough. Brown suspension cost him the semifinal and the championship game a year ago They're the first four games of this season. We've seen a lot of run on, on first and second down for Alabama. Why don't you cross midfield? You get a first down. This is the area of the field where you love to go play action to Jerry Judy. Here he is right here over the top. 
That's Judy in motion. Tunga Baloa wanted to take a deep shot. Now he's running out of trouble. And he will slide down at the 42. And you see Marquise Waters get his hands up really quickly. As if to say, hey, that was not a late hit on the quarterback. No Great flags cover, on the yeah. field. Great coverage downfield. It was the play action. Hard play action. He wanted Devontae Smith. But the secondary, Marquise Waters, Dylan Singleton, Leonard Johnson, weren't biting on the fake. And because Alabama hasn't been successful running the ball, there's no sting on the play action against Duke. Good look at Jerry Judy, 11th play of the drive upcoming. Play action. Get it to Judy. First down and more to the 20. Impressive 5 of 5 for 74 yards. Seven nothing Bama, 10 to go in the first half. Starting at the 25, and this is the worst starting field position for Duke to this point. Deion Jackson couldn't get there. Quick coverage there by Alabama's defense, led by Christian Harris. Aerial coverage provided by Goodyear, recognizing those who strive to rise above the rest. Goodyear, more driven. Pressure is squarely back on Quentin Harris now. They played admirably on defense, but how long can they hold up against the Alabama offense? They've got to get some production and points on offense. Harris has yet to hit on a pass, so give it to his wide receiver, Jalen Calhoun. True freshman, former high school quarterback, of course, like everybody else. Gain a two on the play. What do you have against quarterbacks? I'm just saying high every single player at this level, seemingly defensive linemen here, are <laughs> former high school quarterbacks. That's because they're smart. I got okay? it. They, they know how to run routes because they know what the quarterback wants to see. They're all high school quarterbacks, and they've all been coached by their dads. It's amazing. If you're a coach's son or a right. high school quarterback, he just doesn't like you. Yeah. Let's get Molly up to speed on the inside jokes. Here comes a sack. Terrell Lewis. His discipline time is over as well. Quentin Harris feels the pain. This is a sight for sore eyes for Alabama fans. Terrell Lewis, after two years of being injured, first time, first drive back in this game off of his suspension for the first quarter, and you see the talent level. That, that stunt right there is made for Terrell Lewis to make the play. Chris, he looks different. I mean, he is he is an absolute physical freak. And I know he hasn't played a lot of football, but you go back. They're responding. You know they're trying to go outside, stay on their toes, because there's an opportunity there, Steve. Molly, thank you. Watch for that. Bama with the lead for the first time. And their best starting field position. And it's not very good. Waddle's going to flip the field right here all by himself. Jalen Waddle staying on his feet. Eventually, Hayward and Kwanzaa able to bring him down. 38 yards on the play. You got to get that ball in the hands of these wide receivers. And Jalen Waddle, he hasn't touched the ball a whole lot early in this game. It's been more of the Jalen Jerry Judy show. But you see the talent, you see the elusiveness and the speed. All four of these receivers are game breakers. And that's what Waddle does so so well. I mean, he has 19 yards per catch last year, 15 yards per punt return last year. I mean, this guy can make plays when you just get him the ball. Short, short yardage situation. Todd, you probably couldn't see it, but they're working on it. Looks like his left shoulder right back to Jerry Judy. It looks like he made it come down hard on that left shoulder. We'll keep a keep an eye on that. This is the end of the play when he goes down, watch his left shoulder. Right there, and big Serenord comes down the defensive tackle on top of him. Dylan Singleton got the worst of that collision. See the numbers on Waddle, and his numbers will be a lot better. Ripped off one for 50, was called back because of a penalty. Second down and one. See Jerry Judy come over and ask how Waddle's doing. These guys are close. All four of these receivers care deeply about each other. It's really cool to see. Harris on the ground. Don't think he got there. Should be up a third and one. Shaka Hayward makes the stop. You think about the wide receivers, the diva group of yeah. every football team. And 
They really seem to be all about themselves as a group, collectively, not individually. You don't see that very often, and especially at that position. You, know, you think about the NFL, you think about you know the Divas, Antonio Browns of the world, right? But this team, these four are unique in that they work as a unit, and, and if they succeed, they all succeed together. Brian Robinson get his first touch and should have the first down by inches. In the last two years, we've spent a lot of time talking to, to these receivers, whether it's Henry Ruggs or recently last week, Jerry Judy. They really, like, they legitimately love each other. It's crazy. You never see it. You've got Judy who's going to be a top five pick. Ruggs is going to be a first round pick. Devontae Smith is going to be a draft pick if he leaves early. Jalen Waddle's not eligible, but he's going to be a draft pick two years from now. So just to watch how unselfish they are, it really is a special group. Coming up on six minutes to play in the half. Some pressure coming. It's picked up nicely. Tunga Bailoa hits Devontae Smith. Makes a move inside the 10. And he is punished and pushed forward inside the five-yard line. We've seen the ball go to Jalen Waddle, Jerry Judy on quick passes. Now this one goes to Devontae Smith. This is a staple of Steve Sarkeesian's offense. He's going to run crossers, try to get him open and get him the ball quick. Here's Robinson. Goal line. Got there. Touchdown, Alabama. Great effort here from Robinson. His first opportunity on this drive to get in ball game. Looks like his knee was on top of a hand. I think that's a good that's a good call. And that official was right there down the line with a great look at it. His knee would have gone down, but it was on top of Shaka Hayward's hand. They're going to take another look at this. The ruling on the field was a touchdown. That ruling is under further review. Right there, the right knee. It's hard to tell you. I think, I think that was a good call, and I don't think there's enough evidence to overturn that call based on what we can see. I agree. He comes right down on the forearm. That's clean living right there. You come <laughs> on down just on the forearm, and that should count as a touchdown. Impressive drive there from Alabama. Running the football. The quick passing game to Judy, to Devontae Smith, to Jalen Waddell. You know, when you start to you, you open this game, if you're Alabama and you're a 0-0 tie after one quarter, and Nick Saban says, let's get the ball in the hands of our playmakers, take over this football game, and they did it on the last two drives. I guess you can look and say it, there might be doubt that the knee hit the ground, but you can't see it because of the hand. And based on the ruling on the field, I think After this review, going to, have to stand. The runner's knee was down with the ball at the one half yard line, where it will be wow. Alabama's ball, second down and goal. Conclusive evidence, clearly. Yeah. Please. I don't. I, I thought you have to have conclusive evidence to overturn that ruling on the field. Rogers Redding, talk to me. Well, it may be that they had another look from another angle. On that look, like you said, it's it hard to tell whether that knee was down or not. But they, they may have had another look, but they felt like that they had enough to, to overturn it. The Will linebacker, Ali Cajo, came in to block, leading to that Brian Robinson touchdown. So now we've cleaned up that little matter. You can see number 10 in the middle of your screen on the kick return coverage. Cajo, not Jones. You know, backup quarterbacks do a lot of things. They typically don't lead fullback play on the they goal hold. line, Levy. They hold. So, they don't yeah. block. So that might have given you a, a tip as to who that was. That's, you know, early. It's the first season. Of the first oh, games. yeah. You know, we'll come across three or four te uh, teams with, you know, three or four same guys with the different guys, same number. So. Greasy's always got all the answers, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Yeah, my, Thank you, I got Todd. You, bud. Replay never lies. <laughs> the, the film never lies. Fifth possession for Duke now. And the flip. Britton Brown trying to get something and sort of 
slow the momentum now that Alabama has. I'm a little surprised David Cutcliffe hasn't gotten the football to Deion Jackson a little bit more. He's, a, he's their most dynamic playmaker. Britton Brown's a good back, but he's, he's not the same kind of a playmaker. That's the one advantage that they have against these young linebackers of Alabama. Brown again trying to push the pile. Bring up a third down and short. Tonight, as we watch one Heisman hopeful, another Heisman hopeful will be in action. Justin Herbert and 11th ranked Oregon take on number 16. Auburn from AT&T Stadium, 7.30 Eastern, right here on ABC, streaming on the ESPN app. Spectacular features and views of this stadium, just over two years old. It's already hosted some huge college football games. And looking closely for Molly in there. Did you see Molly? I not seen her in some time. <laughs> Her and McShay are hanging out in the Mercedes-Benz Lounge. Back to work, you two. Henry Ruggs is back to work in his Alabama offense. Very close to the first down marker. Leonard Johnson made the stop. Steve, I'm out here hustling. You're up there in an air-conditioned booth. It's a little warm down here on the field. I'm running around in heels. Give me a break. 72 and perfect. <laughs> right up here. Isn't this place air-conditioned? Thought so. Yeah. All right. Wasn't the brochure. I don't know why, Levy, but she's hiding from me. I haven't yeah. seen her all night. Can't explain. Welcome to the club. Oh, tripped up at the line of scrimmage. Harris looked like, and he tapped the forest all on the shoulder pad. That's friendly fire. Third and one. Starting to see this Alabama offense get into a rhythm. They've got all their weapons now back out there. Both backs. They're substituting. They've gotten the receivers into the game. They've made a, a switch at left guard. They took the true freshman Evan Neal out and put Emil Echior in there. So uh, Steve Sarkeesian starting to call them all the plays on offense. Third down and one. Not going to happen this time. Brian Robinson is dropped by Trayvon McSwain for a loss of two. Just talked about Emil Echior. Replacing Evan Neal at the left guard position. He's number 55. He just gets beat inside by Serenor. That's bad. That's bad technique on third and short. And that's why Evan Neal started the game because he's a much bigger physical presence. And Echior gives it up and they don't get the first down. Serenor, it's a good story for Duke. Granted a sixth year of eligibility. After surgery, after he ruptured his right Achilles in October of 18. Just the second punt of the night for Alabama. A fair catch from Josh Blackwell. It's a punt of 41 yards for Skylar DeLong. 14-0 bounce. Guys up against each other, right? One has a lot more talent around him than, than the other, but uh, Tua Tungavailoa and the offense started slow, but they've picked it up in the second quarter, and Quinn Harris is still trying to find his footing. Opportunity here for Duke. Minute 22 left. Harris will keep it. Stay on his feet. He's dragged down. Second and short. Duke has all three timeouts. And Duke did defer to start the game, which I thought was somewhat interesting. So Blue Devils will get the football to start the second half. Harris to throw. Take a deep shot. Got a man in his caught. Scott Bracey. What a grab. By far the longest pass play in the game for Duke. Good for 34. Yeah, great job by Bracey. 6'2", 210 pounds. He's been making these plays all during fall camp. That ball is perfectly thrown right on Trevon Diggs, the best corner for Alabama. Harris looking to run out of there. He'll just get past the line of scrimmage and a timeout with 44 seconds left. Duke lost their top four receivers from a season ago, and their best receiver is Jake Bobo, and he's out with a clavicle injury. Yeah, TJ Ramming, Jonathan Lloyd, two of the best receivers in the ACC a year ago, and working with Daniel Jones, that's what really made this Duke team hard to defend. But a different offense this year, obviously, with Quentin Harris. They need some of these younger wide receivers like Bracey, Jalon Calhoun, and Harding to step up on the opposite side of Aaron Young. The news on Bobo isn't all bad. They expect he's going to miss the first two games of the season, but at least they'll get their best receiver back. Duke, Duke had 31 passing touchdowns last season. That was a school record. Of those 31, only six of the, rece the receivers who caught six of those 31 
return back this season. Second down and eight. Harris has good protection for the end zone, and the flag comes in. Looking for Aaron Young, Josh Job never turned around. Pass interference, defense number 28, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Great idea, just go up to your best receiver. We just talked about Aaron Young. Take a shot, and Josh Job is there, and it's very clearly pass interference. And a great job by the right tackle. This is the right tackle, the true freshman monk. Look at him on Terrell Lewis. That's a heck of a job on one of the best players in college football. Here's Harris in some rhythm now underneath for Jackson. And he is dragged down, importantly, inbounds. Gain of four. A big-time play by Shane Lee. Getting Jackson down inbounds. Jackson is the quickest of these backs. And if you let him get out of bounds, it's not a good thing. That was a great play by Lee. Duke will spend their second time out. This week, Sunday Night Baseball has rookie slugger Pete Alonzo in the Mets. Taking up Bryce Harper in the Phillies. Both teams fighting for a wild card spot. And then Monday night. Before the NFL kicks into gear, Brian Kelly's number nine Notre Dame. We'll take on Louisville, catch both games on ESPN and streaming on the ESPN app. Opportunity here for Quentin Harris right before half. You know, it hasn't gone the way you wanted it to, but you're down two scores. You get any kind of positive momentum field goal here. You got to be smart with the football. Take the shot if it's there, but don't give up the three points. Only one timeout left, 29 seconds on the clock in the half. Harris, quarterback draw. Shane Lee again was on it. And they'll have to spend their third and final timeout. It looks like every time he's dropping back, it's either get the ball out right away or start moving around because you can see it's very evident Terrell Lewis number 24 the defensive end who we've talked about had a sack earlier in this game he is forcing pressure early on basically every single passing snap last time Terrell Lewis saw the field was yep. in this stadium in a championship game of course not playing last season well he's a difference maker there's no question about it you know he's a Last year, you could argue that there wasn't great pass rush from the edges for Alabama during the course of the season, but Terrell Lewis is, is certainly one of the top two or three edge pass rushers in college football, and the only question, can he stay healthy for the entire season? The Bama defense a year ago gave up 322 yards per game, the most since Nick Saban's first year. There were holes. Third and three here. Fake to Calhoun. Harris going to throw for it. Not even close. Fourth down. Yeah, they were trying to isolate Noah Gray with play action hard. But it just, it just didn't, it, there's lack of awareness here from Quentin Harris. You see 87, and uh, he just throws the ball in the back of the end zone, but Gray never able to get off coverage. Nice job by Xavier McKinney. Grease, the kicking story is interesting for Duke. A.J. Reed is on for a 30-yard field goal attempt. He did not have, not had a single field goal attempt in the last two years. Bit of a redemption tour for him. And Reed able to boot it through. And so Duke gets on the board before halftime. And again, the Blue Devils will have the football to start the second half. We talked with Coach Cutcliffe and Talked about moral victories, and you know he knew they were five touchdown underdogs coming into this one. But that's not their approach. That's not their attitude. This would be a measuring stick where they are. So at 14-3, approaching halftime, it was very similar to the way they played Clemson a year ago. You know they were down 14-6 in that game. Now the second half got out of hand. Okay, right. So, uh, but this is a team. I think he was ready. He told us that the program at Duke was ready for this opportunity on this stage. Maybe a couple of few years ago, they might not have been ready, 
but they've been recruiting well. They've got seniors on the defensive side. They felt as good as he's ever felt about the lines of scrimmage, the offense and the defensive lines, and they've held their own tonight. Another difference I think was from a season ago is they were mentally and physically exhausted yeah. against Clemson, right? They have had the entire offseason. They have been pointing towards Alabama all along. And, you know, some of the suspension or discipline by Alabama maybe plays a role. Bama got off to a sluggish start here today. Nick Saban got his message across, yeah. and he's still out in front. Fair catch. That's Forrestal. Well, that's the first touchdown for Alabama. Make sure you stay tuned for the State Farm Halftime Report. Kevin Nagandi, Jonathan Vilma. And we'll officially met a welcome Mark Sanchez to the squad for the first time. State Farm Halftime Report coming up with the fellas in some 11 seconds of football time. See Harris getting some attention. What's the Duke take going to be here, Grease? Well, I think, you know. Feeling pretty good about themselves. I don't think that's going to be what Coach Cut says in the <laughs> locker room, no. And that will do it. This will raise some eyebrows around the country when you see a halftime score. With Alabama leading Duke 14-3. And again, the Blue Devils will get the kick to start the second half. Down to Molly McGrath. Thank you, Steve. Coach, some mistakes by some inexperienced players early on. How will you address that at the half? Well, I think the only way they're going to get experience is to play. Um, we, you know, we got a couple penalties that canceled out explosive plays. You know, we gave them the ball back when we got second and one, and they were able to get three points. So we just need to be a little cleaner in the execution of what we're doing all the way around, offense, defense. So we'll get it fixed. How did your offense change when your suspended players came back into the game? Not really. We didn't change the offense at all. I mean, just had better players executing it, and I think they play with more confidence. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Steve. Thoughts from Nick Saban for president or definitely the greatest college football coach of all time. Both are fine positions to have. <laughs> David Cutcliffe just moments ago. You got character, you have conditioning, you have discipline. We've had a really disciplined first half. Two penalties, no turnovers, you're doing the things, very few missed assignments. You're playing like a Duke football team. Now you go finish your job, and they have no idea. They think they've seen your best. Really? Huh? They think they've seen your best. Come out of here with intention, man. Come out of here with intention and make every second count. Let's go get it done. Let's go! And that's how Duke will come out and get ready to start the second half with the football. I love that, right? I mean, that is the exact correct tone from David Cutcliffe. They, they, they are not down in any stretch, right? This is an 11-point game. There are 33 and a half point dogs coming into this. Nobody expected them to play with Alabama. And they're right in this football game, so no reason for them to doubt each other or, or their team or their approach, quite frankly. And that goes in line as to what Coach told us this week. He said his biggest concerns, how prepared we are, how will we play. No turnovers, handful of penalties. Yeah. Two. They played it clean, played it pretty straight. Michael Carter just inside the end zone. He will take a snap, take a knee. You know, with that being said, yes. you know, as you look forward to the second half, uh, this is a huge drive, a huge possession for Duke, right? They got three points at the end of the first half, and now an opportunity to go back on offense. If they can get some points here, the whole complexion of this thing might change. And Bama got all their points, Grease, in less than a five-minute span. You know, so that was just one sort of snippet of that first half. But you're right. This figures to be an important possession for the Blue Devils. See if they're going to hang around. Empty set right off the bat. We have not seen this from Duke to this point in the game. Deion Jackson, the running back, to the bottom of your screen, split out. There's a delay of game. And that's not how you want to start this drive. Delay of game. Offense. Five-yard penalty. Still first down. Wish we could go back to Coach Cutcliffe now. Instead, here's Molly. 
Well, before halftime, Duke's quarterback, Quentin Harris, uh, seemingly hurt his right hand. That is his throwing hand. And his head coach, David Cutcliffe, told me that it's not a problem. He said he's banged up a little bit. He's been hit a lot, but it isn't an issue, and he's not worried about it. He wants him to be more aggressive, though, offensively. And he said he's going to turn more to his slot receivers in the second half. Bit of an issue with that snap. Well, his slot receivers are his running backs, and that's Deion Jackson. We talked about him in the first half. You need to get him the football. He's their best player, and he's lined up across from Josh Job now. But they're going to have to throw the football to move the ball in the second half. Loss of two on the play. Zips one across the middle and complete. It's Noah Gray for the first down. Gray gets his first grab. And Gray gets matched up on Christian Harris, the freshman linebacker. It's, this is an advantage for Duke. Get in this empty set and, and isolate those two freshman linebackers, 35 and 8, with your best players. 21 yards in that last play. They wipe out the penalty yardage. Harris going to take a shot right sideline. There was some contact with Jalen Calhoun and Patrick Sutan. What a throw here from Quentin Harris. Comes right out of the second half. Two quick completions. And then this ball was thrown perfectly to Calhoun. He was running the route against... Patrick Sertan, look at that ball, went off the hands. Should have made that play. Second down and 10. That's Britton Brown, the bottom of your screen, the running back. In motion. Fake it to him, and Harris will keep it for a couple. Todd. You know, it's interesting to, to see what they've come out and tried to do offensively. First half, it was the triple option. They were trying to attack the middle of the field. Now they come out, and they've, they've been in five wide basically every single snap of this first drive. Imagine all the different offensive schemes that they have put in over the offseason. <laughs> they a long summer. <laughs> Duke, one of seven, converting on third down. There's third and eight. Harris, a quick throw. It is juggled and caught for the first down. It is Noah Gray. That ball was deflected at the line of scrimmage. Ray, who's considered the second best receiver on this team, makes the grab for 10. Xavier McKinney had, thought he had an interception return for a touchdown. He's number 15. He just doesn't make the play and allows Gray to catch the deflection. Eyes get big, right? When you think you got six, he's going a lot of green the other way. Harris trying to load up, hit as he throws, and overshot everybody, including Aaron Young. The fifth year senior. Hey, Duke's not afraid here, Greece. No, Taking a shot. Come out and take your shot, right? What do you have to lose? Uh, after that halftime speech by David Cutcliffe, you know, you gotta you can you can say all the motivational things you want, but as a coach, you have to give them some tools once you get out here on the field. They're overmatched, yes, but that doesn't mean that they can't come out, change things up, and keep this Alabama defense off off guard. Second down and ten. Harris all by himself in the backfield. Bama rushing three underneath and all of a sudden it's the Noah Gray show for a couple what do you think Nick Saban's speech was like at halftime I, I keep waiting for those cameras to be allowed in there we'll be able to replay some of his <laughs> halftime speech I think he, I think it, what he's saying is listen guys we got to play better you know the first quarter of this game they didn't play very well they turned the football over uh, but I don't think he's panicking by any stretch of the imagination the first game out is typically pretty rocky empty again on third and eight Again, it's Noah Gray. Fourth grab. Almost in a row. Gain of five, and he's hurt. Xavier McKinney put the lick on Noah Gray. Who still got the football. And in some pain. He'll be right back. Yeah. Took a big shot, though. But David Cuckler deciding to go for it here on fourth and three. I think this is the right decision. You got, uh, you're in this red zone fringe area. It's, it's too far for a field goal. Punt doesn't get you that much yardage. So why not take a shot? They tried it earlier in the game. It's a pressure look from Alabama. Everybody's up, man to man. Harris is trying to throw for it. Underneath, it's caught and not going to get there. The ball pops out. Scott Bracey caught it. I think they're going to say he was down. And they're going to turn it over on downs. Excellent defense by Alabama. There's one-on-one -on -one tight coverage, and Bracey did a great job catching the ball. Then he was fighting for the first down. See if he uh, he had to get to the 34-yard line. 
He, reached the, he never had a chance to reach the ball out. That's a great job by Xavier McKinney. McKinney, the one that missed the interception, potentially returned for a touchdown earlier in this drive with a great tackle, not allowing him to reach that ball out. And that's what you call an unassisted tackle in a big way. Xavier McKinney coming up big for Bama. Right back to offense. Under some pressure, Tunga Bailo will throw it and complete. Jerry Judy to the rescue. Shaka Hayward nearly got home after the game of nine. I'm watching from behind. I don't, I don't know how Tua got that, that ball off. I mean, the pressure was there immediately. He moves around to buy some time, and right as he's throwing the ball, you've got a, a defender coming in, and he, he's able to get it. Usually that, that ball is going to wind up sailing or going into the ground because he's hit. Great job by Tua to complete that throw. Now he's completed just about everything. He's, he's 17 to 20. On the ground, Najee Harris has the two yards, given three for the first down. Tungo Bailoa has completed 11 consecutive passes. Look out, Greg McElroy. He's coming for you. McElroy holds the Bama record, which is 16 consecutive passes. Please. Well, we can talk about the playmaking ability of, of Tua Tungo Bailoa, but the thing that, that I love the most is the accuracy. That is the number one trait in a quarterback by far, and he's one of the more accurate quarterbacks in all of college football. That's 12 straight completions. It's Forrestall again. Marquise Waters is stopped. And I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, Tua is now healthy. At the end of last year, he was not healthy. His lower body was beat up. You know, part of that was on him, too, not throwing the ball away and uh, not taking what the defense gives you, trying to make a big play all the time and taking hits. Uh, but he's, he took the time in the offseason. He got healthy. And now he looks like he's back to his old self. On the ground for Harris. Forced to the outside. And he'll be very close. See where they spot him. Looks like they're going to give him the first down, and there's an injured player. Uh, Edgar Serenord. Yeah. Edgar Serenord and Landon Dickerson got into a tussle, and Serenord threw a punch at Dickerson, and he's going to be ejected from this football game. Come out after halftime and, and you're emotional and you want to get back in this football game and you get tangled up with Dickerson and the helmet came off. Two helmets off. But you just can't lose your cool and, and take a swing. Serenord is sixth year. After the play was over, on. personal foul, defense number 92. Number 92 is disqualified from the game for a great flagrant personal foul. First down. Fifth year senior from Miami, who was just granted a sixth year of eligibility. And that's how his opening day will end up. And that's not the way to go out, either. That's not the way to go out, right? Like, again, you're emotional, but uh, when you lost your cool, you lost your composure, and that's the way you go off. That's, that's not Duke football, right? That doesn't represent David Cutcliffe and doesn't represent the, uh, the University of Duke in any way, shape, or form. So Dickerson waving goodbye. Let's see when he gets back in the game. Tungo Bailoa throwing for Judy. Just too strong. Duke got away with one there. They were in man-to-man -man coverage. It was a single high, man-free coverage. And when you watch that, I mean, Judy almost always is going to be able to beat coverage. He does one-on-one, -on -one, and the ball's just a little bit overthrown. Tua wants that one back. Finds Judy in space, and Jerry Judy can make his own space. Down to the 10. Dylan Singleton got just enough of him. So if you're going to play man-to-man -man against Jerry Judy, you, you, you can't come up and play press because that's what happened on the previous play. He almost get beat. And this time you play off your Marquise Waters, and now you got to come up and try to tackle this guy. And look at the speed and the acceleration to the outside. It was very difficult to defend. There's Judy again in space. Inside the five, still on his feet. He wants the goal line, and he won't get it. Oh. 
We talk a lot about the speed of Jerry Judy and the route running ability. He's still down. We talk about how, how physical he is when he was trying to get in the end zone. He took two or three big shots and he's still down on the field. I get it. You want to make a statement. You want to establish yourself in that wide receiver room for this offense. You want to have that physical nasty attitude that you can do anything and get it in the end zone. But at the same time you need to preserve the health of your body for a long season. An entire state holds its collective breath right now. They can breathe a little easier. Two guys holding them up. Then you take a big shot from a linebacker coming from the inside. Here comes another big shot from another linebacker. And I know exactly what Nick Saban's going to say in the film room tomorrow. He's like, listen, kid, you're get down. You're a space speed guy. I don't need you fighting for extra yards. That's how you're going to get hurt. But you got to love the nose for the end zone, right? All you have to do is that once. You only have to do it one time. Okay, he, he's proven that he's tough. That's it for the rest of the season. He's good. Uh, number 10 checks in for Alabama down by the goal line, and we all know that means uh, Ale Cajo is blocking as a fullback position in front of Brian Robinson. Duke couldn't get off the field in time. You saw a Duke player running to the backfield as if he was going to sack the quarterback, and he was just trying to get to the bench. So a lack of discipline by the Blue Devils a couple of ways. Here. Well, you can call any a number of fouls. So you can get 12 men on the field, or you can call offsides on Blackwell 31. <laughs> Illegal substitution. The defense had too many players on the field. Half the distance to the goal. First down. I, I thought it was a corner blitz for a second. <laughs> First down and goal. At that point, it's only inches because it's half the distance to the goal. Robinson behind Aho. Two after a quick chat. Here's Robinson. And the push. And get there. Second and goal. Hornbuckle looked like the first man in. Yeah, great push by Hornbuckle on the right side of that defensive line. 59-54. Knifing inside does a great job blows up Caho and prevents Robinson from getting in the end zone Ninth play of the drive coming up Two and a throw for it got a man wide open Caught. touchdown major Tennyson for the score Same look, same situation, and this time they pull it out and they get Shaka Hayward, who was responsible for man-to-man -man coverage. They sell out to stop the run on first and second down. Those are the downs to go play action on the goal line. That was well conceived. And so with all these great wide receivers for Alabama, the two touchdown passes that Tua Tungabaloa has thrown today, Louisville will be up against it at home against ninth-ranked ninth Notre Dame. Eight and a half left. Let's see what David Cutcliffe comes out with now. A wing T offense or something. <laughs> Britton Brown split out. They'll throw it to him. Get him out in the flat. Take some people on. And the football comes out. Picked up by Alabama. Trayvon Diggs has it. And he, he nearly got back up on his feet and ran out of sideline. And Brown is hurt now after coughing it up. Big time play from Trevon Diggs. I think he's. I think the Falcons might be a sleeper in the uh, NFC. Could be a good football team. We know Sark's rooting for them. First down and ten. Tunga Baloa off his back foot, throwing, and it is in and out of the hands of Jalen Waddle. Had it, and then he didn't. Leonard Johnson on the coverage. This was the fake pump screen, and throw the ball in the fade to Jalen Waddle. Nice coverage there from Leonard Johnson. 
you know, he's so used to run after catch, he goes up for the ball, and you could see his head turn just before the ball came in. He lost focus on it. No Jerry Judy after that big hit down the goal line on the last series. Harris patiently picking his hole. Slammed out at the 14 by Marquise Waters. Back to take a look at the sideline after that turnover. Sertan. <laughs> Haven't seen that before. <laughs> a la turnover chain. Right. Everybody's got it. We haven't, seen, yeah, haven't seen that before, right? By, except by everybody. <laughs> Trayvon McSwain knows. Offside with contact. Defense. Number 95. Five yard penalty. Still first down. Those are the pre snap penalties, too. Those talked about by Coach Cutcliffe all week. I mentioned Sark rooting for the Falcons. Spent the last couple of seasons here in Atlanta. Offense coordinator. He said when you're uh, when you're coaching Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley and you come back to college, you get people's attention really quickly. Right, he flips on the film of the Atlanta Falcons, says, hey, we're gonna run this route. Look <laughs> at these two guys running it. You know who they are. Hey, I FaceTime with Matt Ryan this morning. College kids will tend to think that's pretty cool. There's Tonga Barola throwing wide open, caught touchdown. Devontae Smith for the score. The tide's starting to roll. That's a big time play there from Tua Tonga Vailoa. Rolled out. He knew he had plenty of time. He surveyed the field. He didn't try to force it into the back of the end zone. He went through his progressions and his reads as, as Steve Sarkeesian's trying to make him do and uh, finally found the end zone. No time for Tua to celebrate either. He's got to get back on the field and hold for the extra point from Will Riker. 28 3, Bama. Take a look at Tua. He's going to go through this, this naked play. He's going to have a tight end in the back of the end zone. And he wants to throw it there. Right here. He's looking there. He could have thrown it, but he decides not to. And watch the throw here, Steve. He's going to come back at the very end. Once that defender turns his back, he, he decides to throw the football in the flat. And he gets the touchdown to Devontae Smith. That's, that's a great example of Tua going through his reads and not forcing the football, coming back to his third wide receiver. So the Tungabaloa family, we'll see if we get a shot of the back of his uniform. People might be wondering, why does he need a TU in front of Tungabaloa? That's because his younger brother, Talia, who wears number five, he'll have a TA on the back of his jersey, wearing out the poor equipment managers. <laughs> but they'll deal with it. You're going to win the Heisman Trophy and go on to contend for a national championship every single year. Yeah, I thought it was interesting talking to Coach Sarkeesian and saying, you know, we ran a lot of the RPOs, and we're going to do it like we did last year, but that was the base offense, and this year we've got to add progressions. And yes, we can win a lot of games running the RPOs, but when we get to the end of the season, the LSU's SEC championship game, the two playoff games, if we're fortunate enough to be there, with better competition, we've got to be able to do more things. And Tua has got to be able to go through progressions as a pocket passer. Doesn't mean we can't mix in the RPOs, the run pass option, but we've got to be a little bit more multiple and diverse in what we're trying to do. It makes a lot of sense, Brian. I thought it was interesting talking with Nick Saban last night. He said we were too reliant. And that's Mike Loxley, that's Josh Gaddis, Dan Enos. All three of those coaches are no longer on this Alabama staff. They went to take coordinator positions and head coaches elsewhere. Uh, but he said we were too reliant on that one run pass option offense. And when they got to play against Clemson and the better teams, it came back to bite. Harris throwing. Aaron Young could not haul it in. Josh Job had the coverage. And there's always seems to be turnover on Nick Saban's staff. And that might be coming to an end, by the way. We'll get into that in a second. But seven new assistants. Uh, you see eight names out there. Pete Golden was already on the staff. Just sort of a change of position of the defensive coordinator. But it's three consecutive years of changing offensive and defensive coordinator. That's an awful lot of turnover, but it's a, a super successful program. That's unique to, to Alabama and Nick Saban in particular. You know, other programs have a little turnover, not like that. Personal foul, chop block, offense, number 63 and number 67. 
half the distance to the goal. Still second down. Well, it's interesting to compare Alabama and all the turnover the last couple of years. I mean, they had one defensive coach that came back a year ago and then more turnover this year to Clemson. And Clemson, they all their coaches stay. They've been there. It's, it's, a, it's a family, and you can tell that Nick Saban, by talking to him, he, he wants to get more consistency with his coaching staff moving forward. Second and 22. Duke getting backed up here. Go conservative on the ground. Deion Jackson. He'll be dropped at the 25. Another note on the coaching, and this really jumps out at me. There's not a single, not one, on-field assistant that remains from the championship game a couple of years ago. Not one. Yeah. Well, you know, Saban said something to us uh, last night that really stuck out to me. He said for the first time he feels like coaches are coming to Alabama to get a leg up to go somewhere else. They are using the, the process and the program of, of Nick Saban and Alabama to get a stepping stone to other jobs. And, and so he said, I'm going to have to change that. He says, I've been open to coaches coming and going at will. And he says he thinks for the first time he's going to have to change that policy. And where it's really hurting him, he says, is the relationship between all these coaches coming and going to the players, and especially in the recruiting process. Yep, because these coaches are out recruiting kids. For years. You recruit kids, yeah, as, as eighth, ninth, tenth graders now. And the guys that initially start recruiting change every year and that hurts the, the the chances that that recruit will come to Alabama. Bama runs a late guy on. Duke will get the punt away from their 20. Waddle will call for a fair catch and then drift back. Nice punt by Austin Parker of 52 yards. There's a flag on the field back at the 38 yard line. Well, these are good problems to have though too, right? Like, you know, I think Nick Saban, uh, he wants to be in control. There's no question. He wants to be in control of the coaching staff anyway. Holding. Receiving team number four. Half the distance to the goal. It will be first down Alabama. And let's not forget they have five, five head, former head coaches on the staff. As Raekwon Davis told us, a lot of new coaches. The standard is still the same. And there's only one voice. Fans, Alabama had of the star bachelorette. She's got a busy fall ahead of her. She gears up for Dancing with the Stars. She's one of their most famous fans, huh? That's what it says on the card, Grease. Okay. I right, was told to it. read the card. Just clarifying. Got it. See Ray Lewis on Dancing with the Stars coming up. Now there's a star. <laughs> and we know he can dance, too. <laughs> yeah. Every pregame. I don't think, I don't think Hannah's going to beat Ray Ray. Coming out of the tunnel. You know, come out of the come out of the tunnel on Dance with the Stars. They, they probably will. That'd be a oh, great yeah. idea. With the same music, the light <laughs> show, the smoke. You know, I feel Dancing with the Stars is heavily weighted based on your partner, not necessarily the celebrity. Ray Ray doesn't need a partner. All well, by himself. You might, you done might, a lot of dancing with Ray. He might hurt somebody. He danced after he intercepted me. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Robinson stayed on his feet. Stays in bounds. He wants more. No, we didn't see these two, Robinson or Najee Harris, in the first quarter. But these guys got a lot on their plate, too, now. Damian Harris and Josh Jacobs have moved on to the NFL. And there's a lot of talent in these two young men, but Josh Jacobs was a unique talent, unique individual. And Damian Harris, you could argue, carried a majority of the load last year. So but these two guys need to step up in this Alabama offense as well. On the ground, it's Robinson for a yard. Bama thought they were going to have Trey Sanders, a talented freshman running back as well. But he broke his foot in camp. He's out indefinitely. But nobody has much sympathy for Alabama around the country, right? They get an injury. They get suspension. Some tough luck. Changing coaches. Nobody's playing the violin for the Crimson Tide. Nor should they. Five championships in the last 10 years for Alabama. Six overall for Nick Saban, tying him with Paul Bear Bryant. Tongo Baloa, little hitch, giddy up, and able to complete Jalen Waddle. 21 yard gain. They look at some of the injuries, uh, you know, nobody has sympathy, but uh, these are real players that, that uh, were going to impact the outcome for, for Alabama this year. No, no more important than Dylan Moses, the uh, inspirational leader. I feel terrible 
for him. He's worked his way and finally got to a point where he was a captain on defense, was going to call the defense, and everybody was looking to him for leadership. Uh, and unfortunately, he's going to miss the season. Some pressure up the middle. Tua gets out of the grasp. And now we'll run. Pick up a couple. He's across midfield. Chris Rumpf got a piece of jersey and not much more. Gain a six. And I think this is the underrated part of his game, Todd, where he's looking downfield, nothing there, and just the escapability and the athletic ability of Tua Tungavailoa. Yeah, and it was interesting talking to him the other day. He, he put on a lot of weight, he said, 13 pounds. I mean, for me, 25 is where you, you jump off a lot of weight. But he said he put on 13 pounds. He was out of shape because he, he couldn't run, and he was really trying to, to nurse his injuries from a year ago and recover from everything that went on. And he wants to be able to run. He obviously likes it, and he's very adept at it. But he also knows this year, if, if they're going to last, and he's going to play well in the biggest games down the stretch, the SEC championship game and in the, into the playoffs, he's got to do a better job of protecting himself. No question that he has to protect himself better. And it's not just when he's scrambling, Todd, I believe. I believe it's when he's in the pocket and diagnosing uh, pressure. You see his right. mom and dad there. Uh, but but being able to protect yourself is a lot about mental is knowing how you're protected who's blitzing where are my hots how can i get rid of the ball and don't hold the ball it's being a manager at that position of quarterback right back to robinson staying on his feet for first down yardage shaka hayward brought him down but not until he had the necessary yards he needed five times and I, I think steve sarkeesian coming in from the nfl and obviously all those years in college more of a pro style system and just setting him up for success in terms of pre-snap reads i think he's going to allow to uh, to protect himself better in terms of his options pre-snap robinson has swung back around drew jordan first to the party for duke Tungabailoa said, you know, he wasn't feeling really good until May. That's a long time. He doesn't like the turf here. He said it's like concrete. You remember that from the SEC Championship game. <laughs> he hasn't played on real turf if he thinks this is concrete. Right. This is not like the, not the Charmin out there. Not the kidding? kingdom in Seattle. Oh it's like God. a pillow down here. <laughs> oh, these young millennials, they got it so easy, huh, Chris? <laughs> Back when I was playing. <laughs> Tug of Malone, throwing, caught Jerry Judy is in fact back in the football game. Yeah, great to see number four in Crimson back out there. And when he's out there, why not feed him? They're going to play zone this time. It's a three deep zone. I like how he wraps around the zone dropping defender and he's friendly to the quarterback. He gives his whole body up for the target for Tug of Iloa and a nice completion. And they go right back to him again. Able to beat him in and space down the sideline. Jerry Judy, what an effort! Consecutive 21 yards plays for Judy. And the only people not enjoying that effort is this Duke defender who missed him. How nice to be able to throw a little bubble screen out there to Jerry Judy. And it looks like he gave him a little matrix, like in front of his face. He just got a wave and said, see ya, to the house. Puts Jerry Judy now well over 100 receiving yards. Marquise Waters thought he had him, and then he didn't. Only two players have won back-to-back -back Bolitnikoff awards ever. Michael Crabtree in 2007 and 2008, and Justin Blackman in 2010 and 2011. Might there be a third in that group with Jerry Judy? Some of this, some of this offense, right? Like getting him the football last year, a lot of it was on that run pass option, and and why not? It was working so well. But now you bring in Steve Sarkeesian, as Todd mentioned, and you have to expand the offense. You're not looking at the offense to beat Duke. You're not looking at it to beat Ole Miss. You're looking at Georgia. You're looking at Clemson. What Clemson did in the national championship game, and Kirby Smart at Georgia did the same thing. They blitzed to a tongue of Iloa. They played zone coverages behind. They took away the run pass option game. And Nick Saban knows that when we play teams that have similar talent, 
and great defensive coaches, we cannot just rely on that system. So now at the first part of this season, you're going to see Alabama expand this offense, and they desperately need it if they want to get back and win another championship. Carter again. A yard deep will take a knee. Tua Tungabalo has four touchdown passes. Seven such career game. And his career just getting started. We wondered about the fourth quarter for Tua. Barely saw him in the first nine such games in the in the fourth quarter last season when Alabama was blowing people out. And Nick Saban says it's a chance to get some other player, players some snaps, some experience. Yeah, well, Nick has always been about playing his backup quarterback. He's always been that way, and so I fully anticipate seeing Mac Jones in the fourth quarter. Harris, deep shot, Aaron Young. Too deep. Late shot. And a flag. Josh Job was out there playing a little hand fighting. I didn't see anything to warrant pass interference. Though. Pass interference. Defense. Number 28. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. And the NFL Greece, you could challenge that. You, know. and you see, you know, Nick's saying, listen, that was that was good position. We were in good position. Just keep running, stay in that hip pocket. I didn't see pass interference there. And that was thrown by the line judge from way behind, not the field judge where that call would typically be made. Quentin Harris, ball carrier for two. Christian Harris on Quentin Harris on the stop. We haven't talked a whole lot about this secondary for Alabama, but maybe the biggest loss for them was Deontay Thompson, the free safety, who had one of a career year last year, and they're going to have Jared Maiden filling in for him. Flip to Jackson. Running hard. Trying to get that first down. Xavier McKinney put a lick on him. They will move the sticks. But it's As we hit the final minute of the third. It's a secondary that, that is strong on the outside with Patrick Sutan and Trevon Diggs. We've, we've mentioned Xavier McKinney numerous times. He's kind of the Swiss Army knife in that back end. Can cover, can play zone, can blitz, can come down and play the dime linebacker. He's very versatile. It's going to be dependent on him to help get these true freshman linebackers lined up as well throughout the course of the season. Duke at midfield trying to hang around. Harris loads up and throws, and it's intercepted. Trayvon Diggs, speaking of that Bama secondary. And a flag is down on the field. We'll check the marker. There's a flag in front of the Alabama sideline. Trayvon Diggs was in great position. I think he makes this interception. The question is... The ruling on the field is an interception by Alabama. In addition, there is a sideline warning charged against Alabama. There is no yardage assessed. First down, Alabama. He doesn't know that another flag has been thrown on Nick Saban. So this will be two flags assessed against Alabama. Doesn't take away from a great play by Trevon Diggs. He played that perfectly. He was in perfect position. And uh, his team wanted to come out and celebrate with him after the fact. After that play was Nick over, like unsportsmanlike conduct charged against the head coach of Alabama. That will be half the distance to the goal. First down, Alabama. That is unsportsmanlike conduct foul of the game. Nick's still hot. <laughs> Up 35-3 with 20 seconds left in the third. Well, the, you said the season doesn't start until Alabama kicks off. It probably hasn't started until we've had a, a, a meltdown here from Nick Saban. Welcome to the college football season, everybody. 
Doesn't matter the score, right? Nick Saban's still going to be competing. Look at this position by Trevon Diggs. He knows he's in the hip pocket. Turn around, find the football, and make the play. That's as good as you can do it. Trevon Diggs is going to be a special player for Alabama this season. And the Bama crowd going wild. Diggs was off to a great start last season. He was injured early on, and that injury really hurt the secondary for Alabama. They're looking forward to have him for the entire ride this year. Matt Jones is in at quarterback. Gives to Najee Harris. Staying on his feet. We really hear the Alabama crowd. Maybe even louder than when they scored a touchdown. Cheering on their head coach, Nick Saban. The 14-yard game. They love, they love the passion of Nick Saban, right? And Nick Saban won't hold back. You know, talked with him last night. You know, he's, he said, listen, the worst thing is when you win and you don't play well. So he wants to play well throughout the rest of this game. There's no question about it. Fourth quarter on the way, as you can tell. He said $75 million in scholarships. And for that, among other things, we thank you, Chick-fil-A. Jalen Waddle on the receiving end, and Matt Jones has a completion. And here come the Crimson Tide to open up the fourth quarter. While we were in commercial, Nick Saban was still jawing with the on-field officials. Well, I wouldn't call it jawing. I think he came out, he wanted to clarify, like, listen, we intercept the football, and the kids are having fun. They're just having a good, it's not like they're, they're impacting the official Correct. on the field. Like, and I think it, it wasn't even the kids, it was one of the, uh, the assistant coaches. There's Andrew Harris for the first down. I think we'll it was three. I think it was the overzealous uh, turnover belt coach, whoever that is. There, there he is. Look at him right there. See, he runs into the official holding up the turnover belt. Right, right. <laughs> and, and that's what gets the flag, right? There's no players out there. And, and Nick is like, listen, we're having fun. We're trying to have fun. And I agree with him. Keep that flag in your pocket. The turnover belt coach. Yeah, right. Major Tennyson on the receiving end there. That is not, you don't want to be on camera for that. Right? His, his social media is about to blow up. No, 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 no. You, and if his name comes up in the post-game presser from Coach Saban's mouth, he's in real trouble. I'm trying to get his name up on the screen right now. No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Who did we have last year? Was it third down guy we kept talking about, right? Guy yeah. kept jumping up and down, holding the third, third down sign. <laughs> you made him a social media yes. star. What I do, I make stars out of people. It's not he has, he doesn't need my help. Cassidy Humberth already born a star. You're too good to me, Leaves. Take for all state mayhem moment, and we got it in Knoxville. Tennessee struggling against Georgia State. Dan Ellington to Aubrey Payne to put the Panthers up 21 17. The Vols have responded. It's now 23 21 this game over on ESPNU. Brian Todd, Steve. Good one, thank you. Bama across midfield. Harris didn't do anything there. Swarming Duke defense. It's a loss of three on the play. I think it's important here that, that Steve Sarkeesian runs the offense for, for Mac Jones. Give him an opportunity to run the offense. You're gonna, you never know, you might need him down the, down the road. In the SEC championship game a year ago, Tua goes down, yes. Jalen Hurts comes in and helps him win the game, come back in the fourth quarter. These are important reps for young Mac Jones. And that was that was exactly how Saban described it. It's not about protecting Tua. It's more about getting reps for these uh, inexperienced young players. And it's not just at the quarterback position. Here's Mac Jones stepping up. The flag comes in late. Jones gets back to the line of scrimmage. Jedrick Wills are going to get on the right tackle for holding, throwing a guy to the ground. Holding. Offense, number 74, 10-yard penalty. It's still second down. Mac Jones threw 14 passes a season ago, including, oh, by the way, he had a 94-yard touchdown pass to Jalen Waddell. That's the second longest in Alabama school history. So Mac Jones has that on his resume. How long was that ball in the air, do you know? Are you, are you saying it was a screen? It could have been. Just saying. You don't think it was a in the, in the box score? It's a bomb. <laughs> yeah, right. 
In reality, that's a fair point, Greasy. You are short. You are in mid-season form. <laughs> Try to give Matt I'm Jones not, a little I'm, love. I'm not, I'm not mad. I, I had the same issue. I love throwing a screen right. to, you know, uh, Charlie Garner. He runs for 90 yards, right. and now you have a record. So you think it was a little touch pass in the back? Yeah. <laughs> that counts as passing yards to start rushing. Got it. Illegal substitution. The defense had 12 players in formation. That's a five-yard penalty. Still third down. Two is still very much in this game. Tonga Valoa had a brilliant third quarter. That's that's where the blowout really came into effect. 10 of 12, 128 yards, and three scores. Three consecutive scoring drives coming out of the half. And it's, it's hard to believe that this was a scoreless game into the second quarter. And now here into the fourth, it's 35-3. There is Jalen Waddle. He's going to come up just short here, I think. This is telling to me that you have Mac Jones in and all the starters are still out there. You've got the starting wide receivers, the starting offensive line, one of your starters at running back. And I think you're going to see that up until, you know, maybe 10 or 8 or 10 minutes left in the game. But they want to evaluate and get Mac Jones on the same page with these players in particular. And going for it on fourth and three. Duke will take a timeout. 11.06 to go here in the fourth. The question whether Alabama offensively would come out and roll early in the season. The question was, uh, are they going to be able to do it when the season's on the line at the end? Mac Jones under some pressure on fourth and three. Able to get the necessary yardage. Keep the drive alive. Nice job by Mac Jones, not flinching. His protection is not great up front. you got a free runner. And he comes up, makes a little move there on the linebacker, and gets just enough for a first down on fourth down. <laughs> last season, Tonga Valoa last season averaged a touchdown every 10 snaps, Greece. He's slightly off this year's pace. Uh, it's every 12 snaps so far today, Cassidy. Thanks, Steve. Let's take a look at one of AT&T's best performances. South Carolina taking on Mac Brown and UNC. Sam Howe to Diami Brown for the juggling show and score. Three-point game in Chapel Hill. This one is over on ESPN. Steve, Brian, Todd, back to you. You know, we don't root, Greece. We're not in the rooting business, but I'm rooting for Mac Brown. Yeah. He's one of us. Hope he has success back in North Carolina. Unless you want to jump in on that one? Okay. Time for today's <laughs> Affleck trivia. You're rooting against Mac Brown. No, I love Mac Brown. Are you kidding? Which three Duke alumni are in the Pro Football uh -huh. Hall of Fame? Oh, good question. That is a good one. <coughs> We're going to answer right away. Wait, We're not going to give the people oh, some time. I, I was going to just, I oh, was going to guess. Greasy would have had that. Oh, I definitely had Sonny Jurgensen. I didn't know the other two. I had Ace Parker. <laughs> no, you didn't. Just the other day, I was telling the story. Where, about where, where, did, where, where did Ace Parker play in, uh, in the NFL? Played on the uh, <laughs> San Diego Chargers. In 1934? Of the American Football League. <laughs> and a boy. Oh, my goodness. And you have the answers on the card. No, too. I didn't. Cole gave me the wrong card. No answer card. <laughs> Just a question card. Oh, should we go back to rooting for Matt Brown or not? <laughs> we at that point? <laughs> Sure, Will Muschamp loved that. So people wondered about the injury, and that was the big news for Alabama without Dylan Moses. When's that going to hurt them, right? So nobody expected to hurt him here, right? And probably not in their next game against New Mexico State. In South Carolina. You get the meat of the schedule late in the season. Maybe in LSU. Figure Auburn player is down now. That is the so, left guard. Emil Emil Ecuador, Ecuador. Yeah. In the Mercedes-Benz Stadium at this football game. So a big weekend uh, head to toe in costume or in uniform here in Atlanta. Is that why you're staying weekend. in town tonight, Levy? <laughs> Hanging around. Quick change of clothes. Head out on the town. Mac Jones throw to Jerome Ford, who's back in the game. No lower the shoulder. Take a look at the play just 
prior to the commercial break. Yeah, Emil Ecki or the, uh, the left guard, he's playing center on this snap, but it's number 55 right in the middle of the screen. Looks like he just kind of comes up gingerly on that left knee. They walked him off. Well, they're already missing Deontay Brown, who's out for four games this season. The true freshman Evan Neal and Ekior were uh, either or the starting left guard position, so to lose him would be a blow for that offensive line. Alex Leatherwood was having his hand worked on. And here's Reichert to attempt a 48-yard field goal out of the hold of Tungavaloa. And for Reichert, the first field goal hit the right upright, and that time it's the left upright. The true freshman kicker, Will Reichert. They had a problem last year, Alabama did with extra points. Well, Joseph Bulovas missed six extra points last year. Missed six. nine as a team, yeah. and they're trying to figure it out with Will Reichert. They, they could be the best kicker since Lee Tiffin that Alabama has had in, in some 10 years. So, Greece, on game day today, they had two really interesting things. Tom Rinaldi talking about the transfer portal, and then a conversation on Alabama, how they practice harder than any team in the country and how you see that on the field. And of course, it went back to Dylan Moses getting injured this week. Tuesday, we were in Tuscaloosa, and do you have to make some adjustments there? Well, I think you can tweak it. I don't think uh, th that is Alabama. That's Nick Saban. That's the way that he practices. That's why they are as good as they are. You can't discount that. Now, certainly, you're going to have more injuries when you practice You know, more one-on-one -on -one or good versus good because guys are going. The thing that happened in Tuesday's practice with Dylan Moses, they were just in a thud situation. They weren't tackling to the ground. We were there watching. He came up, tried to, to make a thud tackle on one of the running backs out of the backfield, and it's like he tried to pull up, and he tried to hold off, and that's when he got that knee caught in the ground. Um, all, it's almost safer for, to let guys go and, and not to try to come back and, and thud and be in between. It was just a freak deal. I feel terrible for Dylan Moses, but thud is initial contact, right? Thud you is want, one bump. You know, Not really. Thank you. Yeah, you just. Oh, get so that that's it. thud. Yeah, you don't take them to the right. ground. They don't go to the ground. Yeah. You okay? <laughs> Come on, you're gonna be harder than that next time. I'm tougher than your average Sports Center anchor, you know. <laughs> Quentin Harris throwing and completing. Mateo Durant. Fourth down upcoming. So the replacements for Dylan Moses, Shane Lee, a true freshman, number 35. Uh, he's played well tonight. Obviously, you're going you're gonna to expect to have some bumps in the road, uh, but he's done well. And here's Christian Harris, number eight. Now, Christian Harris was going to be a starter either way. Uh, they felt like Josh McMillan, who got hurt as well in camp, was going to be the starter, but they felt like Christian Harris was coming on so so fast that they weren't going to be able to keep him out of the starting lineup. So they, they felt like he was going to be uh, a great replacement either way. Parker to punt it away. Or shank it. Shank. He's had an up and down day. That'll be a down punt. I guess he said upset alert. <laughs> <laughs> like those, are the, those are the two words everybody wants to hear. <laughs> you want to get everybody's attention. Upset alert. Aerial coverage provided by Goodyear. The best part of every kickoff is the drive that comes next. Go further with Goodyear. More driven. Jerome Ford keeps driving against this Duke defense. You know, there's a lot of uh, conversation this offseason for, for Alabama about their, their mental focus. And we were able to talk with Raekwon Davis this week. And he was very honest with us talking about how last year just wasn't him. He said he thought he'd made it. Uh, he started to play different. The attention to detail wasn't there. Even his family came up to him, got in his face and said, what are you doing? This isn't you. You got thrown out of a game that we did last year. Um, and, and I think he has rededicated himself. He thought he was going to go to the NFL. Um, and it was, a, it was a dose of reality. And now he's had to come back and he's been a model for this team and how they need to reset their focus this offseason. Sounds like when his family got after him, it really got yeah. his attention. One thing to hear a coach say it, when your family member, somebody who's been with you forever, that's some tough love and trying to get around that. And apparently he seems like a, a different person, as you said, coming back. They measured his body fat at 13%. Well, he's a, he's a, a first-round talent, right, Todd? He's so talented, too. You go back and study the tape from 2017. I mean, this guy is freakishly gifted. He just, 
for all the reasons he told us in the meeting, you know, partly looking forward to the NFL, partly just not paying attention to detail and doing the little things that he was doing, he just was not the same guy. The statistics matched up with what you saw on tape. But I went back and studied 2017. I've got him as the 19th overall ranked player in this draft. That's how good I think he can be if he gets back to playing at that level that he was two years ago. Well, we were talking to Pete Golden, the defensive coordinator, and he said, you know, when those two linebackers, inside linebackers, McMillan and Moses went down, the first person in his office was Raekwon Davis asking, what can I do? How can I help? I want to do more. You just let me know. And that's that's a, a great example of him stepping up and having that humility and want to be a leader. We should say hi to Dylan Moses. I'm sure he and his yep. family are watching back home. I had the surgery yesterday. What did Dylan Moses do the night after he was injured? Sent a group text to all the linebackers. Say, hey, keep your heads in the game. You guys got this without me. I'll be fine. You guys will figure it out. And so, but it just shows you the cohesiveness, especially of this defense of Alabama. Well, and it's a great opportunity for Dylan to, to, to get his degree, right? He can focus on that and get his degree while he rehabs and come back stronger than ever. He's going to have a long, productive career at the next level. Got a young daughter, a three-year-old daughter, a soon-to-be three-year-old daughter. Bama going for it on fourth and one with Jerome Ford. And they're able to pick up the first down. Take a look at this week's college football rankings. Are the rankings already out? Rankings. <laughs> wow. Brought to you by Chick-fil-A. I think the rankings should start in October, mid-October. Don't, don't you need a jumping off point? Don't you need somewhere to no. go from? No. No. Come to? We got a third quarterback in the game. Goes by the last name of Tungo Bailoa. That's Talia, the kid brother. And he'll hand to Jerome Ford. Here's Ford down the sideline. Not going to catch him. Jerome Ford for the 37-yard touchdown to blow the doors wide open. Tua forgot he had to hold. They were, he wasn't expecting to get a touchdown. He's like, first I got to get my helmet, then I got to go say congrats to my brother, and now I got to hold for the extra point. <laughs> you know, we told you Alabama gets a touchdown every 12 snaps or so when Tua's in the game. Talia, every one snap when he's in the game, Alabama gets a touchdown there. Imagine that feeling to be a parent and to have not one, but both your kids playing in a game. That's, that's special. And I think it's important to mention, you know, Jerome. And that touchdown, an extra point, in the minds of many, will make up for those two missed field goals by the true freshman. Duke gets ready to get back on the field. Heading into the NFL draft, Daniel Jones inspired, inspired some strong opinions, mostly from our own Todd McShay. Who concerns you of the group that's talked about most and why? I, you know, I would, say, I would say Daniel Jones because I think he's limited. What do you make of him going six to New York? I think it's, it's the fit that they wanted because of Eli and because he's been around David Cutcliffe and he's been around the Mannings, but I think it was a big mistake. One day he could develop into an adequate starter, but that's the best you're going to get, in my opinion. You're taking that player at number six. Not a fan of the pick. I think it was it's kind of Todd to wear the same suit that day as he's, <laughs> as he's wearing in today's game. So I wonder now, it's only the preseason. Levy, you've been waiting all day for this, bud. <laughs> all day? All day. I think since you April You in the first quarter. Since the draft. How's uh, Daniel Jones doing in the preseason? Hey, if, if, all right, let's start with you. Because <laughs> when you and I talked about him last year, I loved you him. had the same opinion I, loved I had. loved him. Good player, solid, some limitations, not ready for the, for the NFL. <laughs> he had a great preseason, and I'm happy for him. I hope he goes on to be a Hall of Famer, sort of. Uh, six overall, I was surprised, and he's played really well, but call me in week eight. Let's see what's going on. Oh, we're going to week eight now. I mean, what, what else can I At do? Week nine, week ten. Call me, in, call me in year five. So I think the backstory is also amusing. Oh, so hard hitting down on the field there. And Brown taking a pounding. So the McShay backstory to that, though, is uh, you were a little concerned and you're thinking, you know, I've only had one Duke game in five years. Like, what are the odds <laughs> of me seeing Duke it's Unbelievable, so right? Quickly. What are the chances? And the schedule comes out and we get Duke against Alabama. I mean, that's unbelievable.
the odds against that. We all have jobs. And to McShay do, was man. McShay was mysteriously absent from our interview with David Cutcliffe. Yeah, yeah. That, that seriously. Was, that's, <laughs> uh, there were some issues in trying to get into Duke's practice. Thank this you, week. Levy. Finally. And we wondered if, in fact, there was some resentment <laughs> aimed at our man. Our he's a great, he's a great young he's, man. Honestly, and I, I, the problem with TV sometimes is honestly. Yes. What's the problem with TV? Kuiper liked them, and I didn't. So what are they going to do? They're going to try to play the hits and have us fight about it. So they, they never wanted to hear about the positive things that, that I saw in him. But I just didn't think. When you talk about six overall pick, I just didn't see it. Did you see it at 17 in the second pick the Giants had? Were you good there? I had a third, a late second, early third round grade on him. So no, a mid fourth round grade on him. Well, what I thought with that you said, Todd, about Daniel Jones in particular was that the Giants fell in love with him because he reminded them of Eli Manning. Obviously, coached by David Cutcliffe, kind of the same cerebral approach to the game as right. David Cutcliffe, and he had as as Eli, and he had the upside potentially. That's what I felt was interesting. And he has experience with the Manners, you know, being around Cutcliffe and, and spending some summers with them. He picked up the offense quickly. He's an intelligent guy, and, and he knows what he's doing. I'm interested to see, obviously Eli's going to be the starter, but I am interested to see with Daniel Jones when he becomes the guy at some point, whether it's later this year or next year, and defenses start preparing for him. Can he keep that level of play up? The way he had, he has in the preseason, he's played well. I mean, the first two games, it was a lot of easy stuff. The yeah, third yeah. game, I think it was, there were some throws there. I was like, uh oh, pocket started collapsing around him. A couple <laughs> deep shots. All right, watch it, Levy. <laughs> <laughs> Were you studying tape, the all 22? <laughs> I watched the all 36. I got a different kind of tape machine, and a flag comes in. Ah, some good-natured ribbing with our pal Todd McShay. And I look, I look for the next year's draft already. <laughs> Pass interference, defense number 11, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Duke, who, you, uh, who Todd, who are you going to be talking about Duke in next year's draft? Like we we know how you know Alabama leads the country in draft picks, seemingly forever. Who's the next guy for Duke? Do they have a guy? In all seriousness, they, they don't. There's not a guy who's eligible this year that is is rated as a, a draftable player. Yeah. McSwain, the defensive lineman who's really who's a backup today, and you saw him on the field, he's he's the highest rated player in terms of the national scouting list and and what scouts went in and, and saw from the, the preseason. So, and listen, it's been four years. They had one player drafted in four years. In the same amount of time, over the four year span, Alabama had 39. I mean, that's the difference wow. in talent that you're talking about. And I know it's a six overall pick, but that's just one player in a four-year span. You know, Duke kind of refers to themselves as a developmental program for football. I think they get that. And we'll want to see the difference in these two programs that we're watching today on the field. And, well, there you go. 39 NFL picks in the last four years, and Duke has won Daniel Jones. Well, he was the sixth pick overall the draft. Well, that, and that, that accentuates the job that David Cutcliffe has done yes. there, right? I mean, he's he's in the ACC. Obviously, he's not in the SEC, but he's going up against the Clemsons of the world in the ACC. Uh, and he's turned this program around. This was a program he took over from Ted Roof uh, 12 years ago. That was 4-42 and 42 before he took it over. And now he's, he's made them competitive. Uh, you can see a difference in the lines of scrimmage in particular. And uh, now he's getting quarterbacks that want to come and play for him because he's a proven quarterback coach to get to the next level. They've won three straight bowls in the eight seasons before David Cutcliffe arrived. Duke was 10 and 82. They were 3 and 61 in the ACC. 3 and 61. Final minute of play. Looking to make it more respectable. Got a man, and it's intercepted. Intercepted in the end zone. It's Jordan Battle on the pick. Well, it's been a tough night for Quentin Harris. And he's going to end it there with another interception. But he's he's uh, you knew that he was going to have a tough time coming into this situation, this environment against this team. This was kind of just a, a fair catch by by Alabama in, in the end zone. But if, if Duke is going to have a successful season this year, they're going to have to grow offensively. Defensively, I think they're good, uh, but but offensively, they're going to need Quentin Harris to step up and make that passing game 
a little more advanced. Duke gets North Carolina A&T next, then Middle Tennessee. Be an interesting coaching job, keeping Quinton Harris' spirits up after this one. Again, better days are ahead, like next week and the week after that, you would think. Well, there's a lot of better days ahead for Quentin Harris, and not just with respect right. to football, right? Like He's, he's in the Fuqua Business School. Uh, he's got CEOs of, of Fortune 500 yes. companies that are calling him, wanting to come work for him. He's got a uh, slew of job offers already. He's in a position to succeed. And succeed Alabama did today. Amazing that this was a scoreless game into the second quarter. And then Alabama turned it on and ran away with it. To the tune of 42 to 3. That's how the season will open for both the Crimson Tide and the Blue Devils. Here's Molly. Thank you, Steve. Coach, three consecutive scoring drives out of halftime. What kind of adjustments did you make in the second half? Well, I think we wore them down a little bit. Uh, you know, in the first half, I think their defense got a little bit tired, but their defense did a great job. Gave us a lot of problems up front with stunting and blitzing. So I think our guys just executed a little better in the second half. Your defense didn't let them into the end zone. What did they do well today? Well, I was really pleased with the way the young linebackers played. Uh, there was a lot of adjustments out there. They did some things that we hadn't practiced, and the young kids did a good job of adjusting. And I was pleased with the way we played. We got some key turnovers and fourth down stops when we needed them. What about your quarterback over here? Coaches have said that Tua has elevated his game this season. When was that apparent today? Well, I, I think Tua played well in the game. I mean, he, you know, we're doing some different things on offense, not just all RPOs. And uh, he operated well, made good decisions, threw the ball accurately in the game, and that's what we expect from him. All right, thank you, Coach. Congratulations. Thanks. As I bring in the quarterback, Tua Tungavailoa.